Thanks, Tim. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna go straight into our objectives because I believe you are familiar with why we are doing this already. So I'm just gonna remind you of our key objectives and then I'll go into the, what you did so far. Uh, so the, the, you have two really major objectives. Number one is to have commercially viable technologies that can be used to actually uh, make sorghum a commercially successful food ingredient uh, in Ethiopia. And number two is uh, to advance the, uh, the uh, new high protein digestible hybrids that were developed at Texas a and uh, in Ethiopia for, for local actually hybrid seed production. So those are the two key objectives that I'm going to discuss uh, mostly uh, this afternoon. So the key accomplishments uh, so far, uh, I'm going to divide them from into field work and then I'm talking about technology development side. And uh, you can see the picture here. These are pictures from uh, last year. I think these were taken in Mieso when we visited the field uh, research station in Mieso, Ethiopia last year. Um, so the field experiments, uh, the key activities that were accomplished last year was uh, number one, of course, we wanted to actually have enough grain to be able to start testing its uh, grain on a larger scale because we've mostly been doing it on a lab scale, but you wanted to test them on a pilot scale so that we have technologies that can be directly translatable to the manufacturers. Uh, so we, uh, with Bill Rooney here at Texas and then we produce about 500 kilos of each of the four traits, which is high digestible, high digestible combined with waxy, and then just a waxy trait, and then a regular low digestible control. And all this was shipped uh, to Ethiopia sometime late last year, was it really this year? It was uh, the shipping uh, kind of logistics were a bit of a challenge because uh, the cost was kind of obscene. Some were quoting more than 10,000 to ship them. So we, we couldn't ship all the 500 kilos. We ended up shipping only 200 kilos of each, which is 800. Uh, below what he wanted for some larger scale manufacturers, but enough to actually begin working on the pilot scale technologies. Uh, so this we have received in Awasa and they're already actually working with the grains right now. Um, so what we were planning for this next year, which is this year, was to actually send some of these hybrid seeds to Ethiopia so that they could actually increase the seed locally so that it would be, again, it, check local performance, but also harvest the grain locally and be able to handle it from Ethiopian side. And that will be logistically more meaningful. Uh, I'm not sure how much the Corona thing is gonna impact that, but we'll talk about that later. I don't know if the train is interfering. Can you hear the train? It's so, always so loud in our building. The train honking. Okay. Okay, good then. Okay, so again, uh, from the field experiment, from the Ethiopian side also, we sent, because we wanted to confirm the performance of these hybrids in Ethiopia again, so we sent 30 of these Tamu HD hybrids to test in Ethiopia, and uh, Alemu and his colleagues at EIR actually did test this in two locations, in Mieso and Kobo, and uh, they also used their local checks and one OPV, uh, to check to actually to compare performance. And the grains that they harvested from these tests were also shipped to Hawassa for quality testing. So this, uh, again, Kebedi and his colleagues are working on this uh, quality testing. Again, you can see there we were in the field that was in, uh, in Mieso last year. And the grains looked very well, almost looked too good to be true in the field. And, but yet they were telling us that the performance at Mieso was much worse than the performance at Kobo. So the field that we did not visit, which is Kobo in the Northern Ethiopia, they said the performance was actually much better. So then it, it must have been very impressive over there because what I saw in, in, in Mieso was pretty good in my opinion. Uh, and of course, you, the guy there, or you, I don't know if you can see, that's this Tamarat guy. He's actually the one who is the, the workhorse behind most of the work that we're doing. He was working with Alemu and he's actually been handling most of the actual day-to-day -day activity. It's a very hard working individual right there. Of course, you know Prof. Kibede 
was with us and this is the the gentleman who was in charge of the field actually station uh, kind of handling the field experiment So okay, and on, in addition, in addition to just testing the hybrids, uh, what we initiated last year also was actually using the uh, the parental lines, so that the Ethiopians could actually begin developing the hybrids locally. And so uh, the Bill did send some of the uh, uh, parental lines to to Melkasa last year, and they did plant these parental lines. Uh, which they call them A and cross with R lines. I have no idea what that means, but the breeders know what it means. And uh, so they did uh, do this for three hybrids in Melkasa. And what you can see in the pictures here, these are the, actually the, the inbred parental lines that they were using. This is the field they were using for a, a kind of a growing the lines and they were doing the crosses. And uh, so they said that they developed three hybrids from these parental lines and they're gonna evaluate the performance of those hybrids this year. And this is a major step forward because this is essentially the initiation of local hybrid seed production. So a very big step for us in this regard in terms of adapting these organs for, for production in Ethiopia. And of course, you can see a Lemu over there for just for the benefit of those who don't know. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Lemu is the one in charge of the breeding side, uh, the breeding component in Ethiopia. Uh, so he's handling the breeding component, he's leading that breeding component for us. And of course, the Tamarite, the guy who is uh, the workhorse, a very hardworking guy helping uh, Alemu on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so this was in Melkasa. They did this at their Melkasa station, this uh, uh, hybrid production or trials. Okay, on the activity side, uh, uh, things were delayed by quite a bit because uh, uh, the funds were transferred late to Awasa. And of course, Awasa, they, without money, they really can't do much because they didn't have any reserves that they could use. But we were with the, uh, what we were able to or ship to them and also the uh, once they received the funds they get things going immediately and they started working on some of the key objectives our objective number one which is uh, very important uh, maybe there's no one in the food science area in the audience but this is extremely important the milling technologies which is something that is easy to ignore but outside of the grain quality itself the milling uh, method has the biggest impact on the performance of any grain in processing. And so unless you have a method that is viable and is repeatable and gives you the right quality or particle size of the flour, you can have all the quality you want in the grain, but you will not get the end product quality uh, that is desirable. So that is why we decided that one of the key areas to focus on was to actually identify the best milling technology that will take advantage of these sorghum varieties to be able to assure that you get a consistent quality and also an optimal quality product. So what we are doing, our initial goal was to use a roller mill, which is typically not used for sorghum, but this is normally used more for wheat. And it's an expensive mill at a laboratory scale. So I was going to do this on my side, uh, and I'm really doing this actually. I have a student working on milling the sorghum with the roller mill. And then we were going to ship this grain, this flour that is milled through the roller mill to Ethiopia. And then they were going to do the local milling with the disc mill. The disc mill here, this is the most common mill that is used to mill F as well as sorghum. And they typically are available on a small to medium scale. So they're everywhere. Uh, you can take your small batch of grain to the, to the mill and then they mill it for you. The mill they normally use most of the time is a disc mill in many places. Sometimes they use hammer mill, but that's a very poor quality mill that we will not test because it's, it normally gives a poor, poor quality product. So disc mill, this is what it looks like on a medium scale. Typically, uh, you go to the mills and this is what you see, this box. When you open it up, you see discs inside that are rough and, and they kind of spin. And actually that's how they crush the flour. So this is the local mill that is available. The problem with this mill is that uh, based on what we know. It is good, but it's kind of a middling kind of a mill. It's not optimal for industrial milling because the quality is not really ideal. It's good enough, but it's not ideal for quality for, for product. And I don't know whether that is because the design is not 
optimized or not, but that is something we are looking at. There is another mill that we call the pin mill. This was not part of our original goal, but we found a pin mill at the guts agro industry. This is typically one of the best mills for sorghum. It gives excellent quality flour. And so we were very excited when we found this at guts and they agreed to actually allow us to use it. So we're gonna add this to our technologies. And then we're gonna compare these three mills. And with this information, we're gonna be able to make recommendations for the food industry that if you wanna really produce good quality flour to give you a best product from, for consumers, this would be the mill that you want to invest in. So this is a very important part of the work we're going to be doing, and we have actually started working on this already. So uh, once we mill these flowers, we're going to take them to the next step, which is testing them in products to see how they perform and so on and so forth. Uh, the other third objective, which is minor, we were just doing this on the side, depending on the resource availability, trying to figure out how to uh, uh, the heritability of this HD trade. So we're trying to hopefully have a method that can easily predict which sorghums have this trait. We continue to use the uh, microscopy method that we developed before to characterize these lines. And with that, hopefully we're gonna run association uh, mapping or whatever Bill calls it. Again, the genetics guys knows that. And then so that we can be able to associate uh, the traits with uh, uh, sorry, the, the genetics with these traits, and then we can be able to hopefully develop uh, a system to be able to tell how this trait is inherited so that uh, we could maybe, we don't have to analyze every sample, or maybe you could develop kind of a simple and more predictive method for detecting this trait in sorghum, because currently the methods we have don't work very well. Uh, Hawasa again is right now characterizing the grains for quality. So this they are working both with the grains that they receive from Melkasa as well as the grains that we ship them from here. And they are really, uh, I'm glad to know, to, to, to actually learn that their lab now, they used to have a problem with the lab space, but now they have a new building. So there's a lot of space that has been created. And so now they finally have a functioning lab that they can actually use to analyze these grains and characterize them for quality. Okay, so obstacles, some of the key obstacles that uh, we faced so far. From the field uh, testing, from Texas side, we didn't have major obstacles last year to report on, but uh, from, from Ethiopia side, uh, from what Alemu told me that, of course, they had poor germination of the parental lines. These are essentially uh, the inbred lines that they used to generate the hybrid. So they say the poor germination kind of limited how much uh, they actually had to work with. But then again, uh, from what Bill tells me is that is, this is normal because when you're working with these inbred lines, uh, they're typically performing so it's a common limitation. Uh, and of course that led to limited seed and also the amount of seed that Bill could send them was also typically very limited because I don't think Bill has uh, enough. I think they can only, because these traits, I think they are recessive, so it's very difficult to purify and that kind of stuff. From what Bill was telling me. So limited seed kind of limits uh, the scope of, uh, of work they can do. And also they told me in Ethiopia, the fall armyworm was uh, a major problem uh, last year in some of the areas that where they were growing these samples. And of course, you guys have heard about the locust swarm that really overwhelmed East Africa. But hopefully, I think this came at late in the season where it didn't cause too much damage. But Alem wanted me to actually highlight that as an obstacle. Uh, from the lab side, as I say, the biggest challenge we had, because a lot of this work, we were relying on it being done at Awansa, and uh, the funds transfer was delayed considerably. So that delayed the project initiation. But uh, I think I'm glad that they're almost catching up with where we were supposed to be working at, and they generated quite a bit of information. But the, also the bigger, well, it's a, it's a problem, not a bigger, but it's still a problem. This led to delay in student recruitment because without money, and this is not just for Ethiopia, even for me, I, I can only have a student once I have funding guaranteed. I have to tell my 
Texas say and then where the money is gonna come from and then they encumber that money before I can actually uh, give my experience. So in Awasa, they had the same problem. They had people who had been identified for PhD, but they could not recruit them because there was no money. So I think they had to opt for to start with master's uh, students to start working on the project for what Kubiri told me. But uh, that has been resolved now. Uh, Balgren, as I say, the logistics was, it was kind of a nightmare to, I thought it was going to be easy, but it was a nightmare to actually ship grain in bulk to Ethiopia because you are at that point where it's not big enough that you can ship, put ship in a container, but it's not small enough that you can ship by air easily. So it, it was kind of a, it required a little bit more back and forth than I expected to actually get them to ship. Uh, and so eventually I think I would, we would really opt for growing this in Ethiopia and harvesting them locally instead of growing in Texas and trying to ship the bulk grain. It's, in my opinion, it's not worth the, the effort and the cost. Uh, uh, reduced uh, obstacles, again, another obstacle is reduced testing capacity uh, with partners because we were hoping to have enough grain that we could share with some of the commercial processors. But if we don't have enough grain available, then we cannot share with them. So that means we're gonna have to cut down on the partners that we were gonna test these grains with because they typically need quite a bit of material to be able to tell you whether it's good or not. But because now we, can, we could not ship enough grain, we have to cut back on the kind of partners we're gonna work with in that regard, uh, at least with the new material until we develop or we produce more locally. And of course, the COVID related restrictions are gonna cause it's quite a bit of challenges for the year, and I'm going to mention those in a little bit. So, achievements, lessons learned. Uh, uh, one of the key lessons we've learned, of course, we were happy that the performance of these HD lines, they were kind of confirmed compared to what we had seen before, uh, because we had previously tested them, and one of the seasons was essentially a loss because the, the the, the, of drought and then another so we essentially had had only one good season but the last year was a very good season and the performance of these lines was confirmed so that gives us confidence that once they develop the hybrids locally it's going to actually uh, be uh, viable to produce them in Ethiopia to be competitive. Uh, we found the yield in one area was considerably higher than in another area, but this was not just for the time lines, even the control check. So I think it's just that one environment was better performing than the other. So that's kind of normal, I expected. Uh, we have also uh, established our pilot plant partners uh, in Awasa, and they are really ready to work with us. Uh, and they're waiting for these grains to be able to start working with us to process them. Uh, for local use. Uh, of course, we transfer the bulk grain uh, to Ethiopian graduate, graduate students have been recruited. Uh, one of them, of course, I was supposed to also work with one graduate student here and the, uh, the student who was recruited was supposed to actually start this summer, but that has been uh, stalled because the university canceled all new uh, they don't, we are not allowed to accept anyone new to the campus until I think end of June or something. So essentially we cannot get summer students. So eventually, hopefully they'll be able to join in the fall and then start working on the project with me. Uh, but in Awasa, they already have students uh, working. And I think Tamarite is also a student who is working with Alemo in, uh, at EIAR. So that's going on. Oh, and HD hybrid development initiated, and I think I think this is going to proceed well because I think Bill also sent additional parental lines this year or is planning to send, so that they can get more seed to be able to work with locally for the process. Oh, this is just a table I attach. No need to actually look. It's just for uh, for the for the team to look at when you have time in terms of uh, the agronomic data that Alemu gave us for comparing the Tamu lines versus the Ethiopian checks. And they were fairly comparable. Some are better, some are worse, but of course, uh, on average, they were very comparable to their local checks. So that gives us confidence that most of these hybrids actually are viable locally. So future activities, uh, 
on the milling technology development, our next step, once we have the flowers that are obtained from these three separate milling mills, we're going to actually make products with our partners that we identified in Awasa. So we're going to make injera and baked products. And then we're going to be able to do side by side comparison and let consumers tell us which of these meals actually gives the best products. Once we have that information, uh, we're going to actually also characterize the flowers for quality properties to identify why one flower gives better performance versus the others. Once we have that quality information, we are going to be able to start developing uh, a kind of information that we can share with our mailers either to tell them that, okay, if you want a best quality, uh, if we, this mail is the one that probably will be most suitable for commercial mailing of sorghum for food, uh, food processing. Or because for example, this I told you there's a disc mill that is commonly used in Ethiopia. That's the most commonly used one on a small scale. If we identify the quality of the flower that works best, we can also talk with the mailers because that disc mill is actually produced locally in Ethiopia. So we can talk with the company that produces the mail and maybe work with them to change the design to actually be able to optimize the flower quality for sorghum milling. So we can both recommend a mail and also recommend to the mail manufacturers to actually uh, modify their design to produce the desired quality flower. So we this information is going to be extremely useful uh, for us. Uh, so field work, of course, bulk grain production, this is going to be, in my opinion, perhaps the biggest bottleneck because we need a lot of grain to be able to move to the next level of tests that we want to do. And this relies on both Texas a and m and EIAR being able to produce some of these grains in large quantities. So there's not much we're going to be able to do until they give us uh, these grains in large quantities. And by large quantities, we're expecting at least one ton of each of the major hybrids. So we are working with them in terms of trying to uh, let them know. And I think they are aware and they're trying to uh, kind of have the logistics are there. Again, the biggest thing that I fear is that the, the this virus thing is going to actually uh, impede a lot of the plants that we already have in place to increase uh, the production of these grains. Uh, so also Alem would say that based on the 30 lines that they tested, they're selecting 10 of the best. And I think he said they probably have selected them already. Uh, the 10 of the best hybrids that they're going to they've identified, those are going to be used for further testing and development. And testing is for food as well as development to produce uh, the hybrids, local hybrids uh, for, for future use in Ethiopia. So that, again, that is ongoing and I think part of it has been completed already. Uh, so future planning, of course, our goal is to, we want to have a standardized grain milling technology that we can share with the industry so that it can help them actually uh, for use for, for producing sorghum. And that we don't think this is just for sorghum, but even for TEF, you're going to get a much better quality flour because sorghum and TEF, I think, uh, they cost grain. So if your milling technology works well for another, it's also going to work well for, for, for the other. Because there's a paper that just came out last year. I, I'm, uh, that the, the guy, it was uh, uh, Disababa University, I think, they, they had a paper where they're comparing that disc mill to other mills that are available. And they showed, yes, the disc mill works well for TEF, but it is far from ideal. It essentially gives you at best an average quality of, of injera when you use a disc mill. And unfortunately, that is what is available locally. And as I say, the disc mill is, is, is a nimble piece of equipment because it, you can change the design to actually change, for example, particle size and stuff like that to, to optimize. And once we have this information, we maybe can work with the mailers to help them come up with a better design that gives you better quality even for TEF injera production. Uh, of course, the, we're also going to standardize the injera production protocol using the sorghum, bre uh, the sorghum lines as blends or even just pure sorghum for commercial use and also standardize baking protocols as well to share with the industry. Uh, 
also the other part we were going to work with the brewing industry because this potentially is a very big market, a big driver uh, for commercial sorghum production. Uh, the waxy, especially the waxy lines that we showed, produce very good adjuncts at low inputs. You don't have to, I mean, require low energy to actually process them. They ferment very quickly. So those are going to be, sorry, very good for adjunct production. And that is also going to be a next step. Uh, the hybrid development, of course, that is going to continue, and that is something that is going to require kind of more of a long-term commitment, but we're going to continue with that. And of course, field testing and grain production in Ethiopia is one of the future plants. And grain production, I mean grain, large quality quantities of grain for food testing. And of course, eventually, of course, we're also going to work with training millers and food processors on milling and processing methods, as well as quality testing methods to optimize quality uh, product uh, for consumers. And of course, graduate student training, and there was a faculty, you see, there are two new ones, Abadi and Tadesi. These are the guys who got PhD from our previous work, and they're working very hard right now with Kebede uh, in terms of actually implementing the the, most of what we are doing in Awasa, the two of them are actually responsible for doing most of it. So training of them, I think one of the things they were asking for was potentially having some postdoctoral, uh, short-term postdoctoral opportunities to visit another region or another country to gain some uh, scale. And we're going to look at the logistics in terms of paperwork and see if we could, they could get those opportunities. Contingency, uh, some of the anticipated challenges that we expect with the COVID, are of course, delayed paperwork and transfer of seed because here, for example, at Texas a and uh, people have been given the whatever instructions to work from home and they're really taking it to heart, which is understandable. Like in our building right now on our entire floor, I think I may be the only one on an entire floor. Most people are working from home. And of course, if you have to work from home, things are going to be slow and delayed and it's not going to be efficient. So even paperwork, to process the paperwork, this is not just for Texas, of course, even in Ethiopia, they have a lockdown essentially. So all these things are going to take time, more time than necessary to process. Field capacity is obviously going to be reduced unless this thing is resolved soon because typically some of the field work requires people to be in close proximity and that is not going to be possible. So this is going to reduce considerably the field work and that means it's going to be delay and this is the red here is the main challenge that you're going to face availability of the bulk grain for pilot testing because this depends on field work getting being able to do enough field work to give us this grain so this is going to be a challenge for us this year getting enough grain for testing with our partners and of course reduce labor even for us in the lab uh, we cannot, I cannot tell my students who come to work, it's not, uh, it's not right, but it's also not allowed. So again, uh, in the lab, you can't do your lab work from home. Many people say work from home, work from home, but they don't realize that for the lab, you actually have to be physically there. Without being physically there, it's still very little that you can actually do. So unfortunately, those are challenges we're going to have to face. We don't know for how long. So adaptation strategy, some of the things that we've been talking about and proposing. Uh, so one of the things we're gonna do is rely more heavily on commercial grains for pilot technology optimization. So what we agreed with uh, our colleagues at Awasa that instead of waiting for the SHD lines to develop, for example, the milling technology, we are just gonna use the commercially available grain in Ethiopia, the sorghums in Ethiopia, and these sorghums have already been identified uh, in collaboration with EAIAR and the local industries. EIAR knows the ones that people like and they have the quality traits and I think uh, Kebedi and, and Alemu, they discuss this and identify the, those lines and those, so we're going to rely on this to actually develop our technologies. And once we develop these technologies, of course, we hope that it's going to translate to when we have the new hybrids, we fit them into this and we hope it's going to translate into these hybrids when we finally have them. Uh, so that is our contingency and also use uh, available grain strategically. So if we have to use this HD grains for any specific purpose that requires that we use them. We have to be very selective in the tests that we choose to run with them or the partners that we use to actually give these samples to try uh, until we actually have enough. Of course, also planning to delay tasks that are not as critical. 
because we don't have to do everything that we propose to do this year. We can postpone the less uh, time sensitive tasks. So for example, trainings, some demonstrations can be postponed to the following year if we cannot accomplish them. It's another time critical. And of course, with that, we have to anticipate that if we do less this year, we're going to have to do more next year to compensate. And with that, of course, we have to uh, reallocate or save some resources for use next year as needed to, to, to account for that expanded need uh, for uh, work to accomplish our projects in a objectives in a timely manner. I think that may be the last slide that I had. Yes. So any comments and questions, anything that wasn't clear? Well, thank you, Joseph, um, for your presentation. Let's open up the floor to the EAB and others who would like to answer a question. I've got a uh, hand up by Habte, I see. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, Habte, I can Go hear ahead. you and I can see you too. Where are you? Are you, are you in Purdue or? Uh, you yeah, I'm at Purdue. Okay, I'm okay. at Purdue, yes. Yeah, okay. thank you for the excellent presentation and the good work. Uh, so I was talking to Alamo this morning and mm -hmm. unfortunately because of the time, uh, it's a little late in Ethiopia, so they, yes. they couldn't attend. So he was talking about the, um, the B lines missing. You mentioned the A and the R lines. They have that, yeah, Alamo also told me they have the A and the R lines, mm -hmm. but they don't have the B lines and I don't think they have, uh, so B lines are required, you know, uh, for those of you who don't know about uh, what B line means, it's uh, the maintainers actually they are required to increase the A lines. So that's one. And so uh, another question uh, for Joseph is um, Have you ever evaluated these um, hybrids against the Ethiopian land races? You know, the, the problem we have locally in Ethiopia is uh, most of these improved. Um, early maturing cultivars, mm -hmm. they are n not preferred by farmers for mm -hmm. injera making. And the land race actually they are very best for injera making. Do you have any preliminary results about um, injera making? Because injera is important and ultimately farmers are going yes. to be using mm -hmm. these hybrids for injera. Not sure. In some parts of Ethiopia, they um, grow some uh, chalky type uh, mm -hmm. local materials mm -hmm. uh, and there's you know the adoption in general for the um, improved early maturing cultivars is low they just stick to their traditional um, land races one of the reason for sticking to their traditional land races is the the injury making property of uh, the local land races are you saying that the chalky types work better for injera for them May not only chalky. I have uh, that we have some evidence. So in most parts of um, Ethiopia, mm -hmm. farmers grow either the uh, like the yellow seeded ones, the mm -hmm. chalky, mm -hmm. and the red. So usually the yellows and the chalky types mm -hmm. they are very good for injera making. Um, Correct. Yeah. So I was wondering how this um, the high digestibility, the waxy hybrids. Mm -hmm look like in terms of um, injera making compared to the the farmer's land base. It's not the, the improved cult local cultivars developed mm -hmm. by the sorghum program. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I am not, I wish Kibeli, uh, 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 oh God, I wish Kibeli was here because uh, I don't want to say something that is incorrect. But yes, yeah, you are right. One of the things that I've, I've been surprised about in Ethiopia more than any place I've visited is how the farmers really stick to the land races. I've never seen that much traditional sorghum grown anywhere else in the, I've been in the world. Uh, ever since I was a little kid, so it seems Ethiopia. There's some there's some reasons why they stick so much to the traditional land races, and yeah. So you're right that in Jera making sorghum is inferior. We know that for sure. And one of the reasons why we started this project was to actually fix that problem because we have these HD lines that we show that they work much better for injera than the traditional sorghum. And when I talk about traditional sorghum, I talk about the standard hybrids. 
because the standard hybrids, one of the reasons they don't work very well, they are normally hard endosperm, so they are not choky. The choky ones typically work easily because the starch falls apart. The, but unfortunately, the, for production, for commercial production, they're not the best lines. They're more prone to disease and other things. So the commercial hybrids you're talking about, why farmers don't like them, is that they don't work well for injera because sorghum doesn't cook very easily. And these new HD lines are specifically overcome that problem because they cook very easily and they make good quality injeras. And we showed that in the previous uh, kind of uh, uh, phase of the work where the local, both the local uh, consumers and the manufacturers loved them so much because they worked so well. Actually, some of them, as I say, worked almost even better than TEF itself. So yes, we've shown that they actually work very well. And there's a, there's a scientific basis for why they work very well is because of their protein structure. Uh, in terms of comparing these sorghums in the field with the land races, I don't know how feasible that is. Is this a land race? Let me ask you, as I say, because yeah, the table, uh, let me see the table that, oh, what is Melcom? Is that a hybrid or a land race? No, no Melcom is um, improved early maturing cultivar. It's, a, um, it's not a land race. They have ESH1 and, uh, and Melcom yeah, because both. the, yeah, probably yes. one of the reasons why the land races would be very difficult to use is that uh, I think there's a gazillion of them to begin with. And which one do you use I, I and think, which one? Yeah, it's, uh, you don't need to grow them together. I know the, the land races are, you know, these are photopericity sensitive. They, mm -hmm. they grow okay. like for seven to eight months in the field. And then, but um, you could compare the grains. Oh, the, yes, yes, I see yeah, what just, you're saying. Yes. Yeah, oh, and actually, yeah, you, well, sorry, initially in the, in the year one or year two of our previous project, that is one of the first things that they did because they took some of the most local popular sorghums for injera and then they compared with these improved HD lines, these mutants that we are using, and they showed that these ones were much better. Okay for yeah. injera production. So that was done, yes, in the first, I think in the second year of our previous project. Okay, good. About the B lines, as I said, uh, I'm going to ask Bill because I know they've been communicating to ask and if, if he, or, or to remind him as well if they have not been sent or not. But I'm going to ask Bill about the B lines. Because as I oh. say, when it comes to breeding, I don't understand that language, but I'll remind Bill, yes. <laughs> yeah, I think these B lines, they are required to, okay. you know, A line is a sterile. So okay. you need the, it's a B um, fertile version to maintain. A. So okay. when you cross A with B, you get uh -huh. back the sterile version A. So that's the only way to maintain the A lines that's required for uh, the hybrid. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah, I'm going to remind uh, Bill to, to. Yeah, yeah. Alamu mentioned this one and mm -hmm. um, they have asked for the B lines. He said uh, they couldn't get that. And Oh, I think one of the things I think. Oh, I saw one email that was exchanged. I think it was about import permit. They were waiting for the import permit from Ethiopia, and I don't think they had sent the proper permit. They were supposed to send another one. I'll, I'll follow up on that. I remember the emails that were being exchanged, and it was an import permit, and they had sent the wrong one at some point. I'll, 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 I'll follow up, yes. Thanks for reminding me of that. Good, yeah. OK. OK, just here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. OK, other questions? We have three that have come in through the chat box. Uh, first one from Peter Matlin. Was the competitive performance of the Tamu hybrids determined only from on-station trials or also in on-farm trials, for example, when grown by the commercial farmers who will be expected to adopt the hybrids? Do commercial farmers use the same level of inputs and management as done on in on-station on trials? Uh I don't think we have tested this with farmers yet because we have not reached that stage of commercial testing. Uh, from what Alemu told me, again, I have to correct me if I'm wrong, is that uh, this, in order for any um, new, is it a new line or hybrid to be approved for, for commercial production, there's a protocol that they follow. I think they start with on-site trials and it has to meet certain a criteria before they can move it to on-farm trial. And then from there, they could also, it has to meet certain criteria before they could 
uh, recommend that for really. So I think we have not reached that stage yet where we grow them on, on commercial farms. Good, okay. Um, Peter, any follow up with that? Are you good? I think. Good. Do you, do you want me to comment on that? Or Hop, that you can comment on that. that. Yeah, you can comment, yes. Yeah, so you mentioned the requirement for relays, you know, in yes. Ethiopia. Uh -huh. uh, we have a minimum requirement of about six environment data mm -hmm. uh, for a release consideration. Then once you have a six environment data, that six environment means you can have two years and three mm -hmm. locations mm -hmm. or vice versa. So that means a total of a minimum six environment. Once you have that data, then you go for, we call it a verification test. It's a 10 by 10, like you select two or three candidate hybrids and you grow them in farmer's field, like 10 by 10. So two on farmer's field and one on stations. So that's called verification test. And then uh, this is evaluated by an independent committee from Ministry of Agriculture. And once that's passed, so it's registered for large scale production for demonstration purposes. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, Tim Lust has a question. I'm concerned that the new uh, highly digestible hybrid will not process anything like commercial grains. Is it realistic to use commercial grain? That is a valid concern. And actually that is, a, that is one of the uh, uh, cautionary tales that we must have if we have to, as I said, this is kind of a, a, a worst case scenario here. It's better than nothing. But yeah, Tim, you're right that they may not process the, exact, the same way uh, as, the, as the commercial grain. So that is a challenge that we uh, still have to grapple with as we try to figure out what to do in case we are not able to get these grains produced this year or only a limited production because of this COVID thing. Uh, in a worst case scenario, we have to actually, we may have to postpone that part of the work until next year. So that is a valid concern. But still, I, uh, I have to say that the information we get from the commercial grains, I think may still be valuable, even if it doesn't directly translate uh, into how these hybrids process. I think it will still be valuable data point that we can use uh, with recommendations as well. But we are aware of that as a, as a challenge, yes. Okay. Uh, Gito has a question and it's asking in general, could you talk about the quality traits? And, and Gito, just a reference in the annual report in the final project report from the first term, there's quite a bit of detail on the specific quality traits, but um, Joseph, maybe you could just brief Gito quickly about the quality traits that you're looking at. So here, the, the quality traits, number one, one of the, the biggest quality traits that we are concerned with uh, is to make the processability because sorghum, the problem with sorghum is a very unique grain in that it's very difficult to cook because it has proteins that uh, uh, we call them hydrophobic. They love, they don't love water very much. They don't pick up water very much. And so that makes it very difficult to cook sorghum grain because the proteins are typically uh, surrounding the starch, which we need to cook to actually give us the, the, the texture that we are looking for. But in these mutants, this HD, uh, the protein is actually inside out. The protein structure is essentially uh, flipped or turned inside out. So they, they, it's more water loving. So if you try to hydrate and cook it, it cooks more easily, more like rice, instead of being difficult to cook, which is a challenge with sorghum, this one's cooked more like rice. So you, you get a better texture, you get a better, cons a more consistent quality product. Uh, that is the one advantage with this HD. The, the word HD comes from the fact that their proteins is more digestible than the traditional sorghum. So that is again, another big advantage. Alia, we need you to mute your microphone, please. 
was that a question or a... no it was just background no, oh, okay okay oh sorry good. sorry sorry okay i thought somebody was trying to ask a question yes so the one advantage is that they are more functional so they process more easily you get a better quality product number two is that the protein is more digestible and that is a big advantage because uh, places where sorghum is more consumed like ethiopia they have uh, protein malnutrition, especially among the population that consume the most sorghum. So if we have improved digestibility of the proteins, this is going to be a big nutritional benefit as well. Can I, Tim? Yes, um, go ahead. Yes. I think there's a follow on. Gito's got a follow up. I see his hand up, please. Yes, why, why I ask this question is, uh, yes, you talk about the varieties, uh, the quality of uh, the grain. Yes, but and also in your presentation, you show also, uh, I mean, the mechanization, how to get a better flower. But my question is, if you do all this work, having a good variety and a good mechanization, and you did not look at the process, uh, once, you, once you make the processing of your grain, do you, have, do you still have your quality grain that you bred for? Because maybe the processing, that changed something in the grain quality, or you lose something during the process. That's why I ask the following question. Did you conduct any study before and after the processing to see if you preserve all your qualities that you bid for? Uh, pro processing generally does not change the inherent quality of the grain. The whole reason why we process the grain is to make it better. So, and uh, this is again a misconception among uh, the general public is when you talk processing, what is it? They think it's some mythical thing that you do and it changes your material completely. When you talk about processing in this case, uh, I, the milling itself is a physical process. So essentially you're crushing the grain into smaller particles. It doesn't change anything about the inherent quality attributes. Uh, if you're talking about processing like uh, cooking, or, or if that changes the protein digestibility, that may be the most uh, 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 logical. Well, we did those tests already and we showed that even after you process them, you still maintain that high digestibility, which is the big benefit. Was that part of your question? Yes, thank okay. you. Okay, thanks. Uh -huh. Okay, there's a comment by Bettina. Bettina, would you like to unmute and just uh, present your comment because it's quite extensive? Yeah, one comment and some questions. So the comment was regarding the hybrid seed production. I think you really need to find a solution to produce hybrid seed in an economic manner in Ethiopia. Because I, I would not say that it's normal that hybrid parents do not germinate well. There's obviously a need to select hybrid parents and to treat their seed uh, appropriately so that they do germinate well. Otherwise, hybrid seed will be by far too expensive and growing hybrids cannot be economical for, for the farmers. So that's just a, a comment and an encouragement uh -huh. to work on this with the breeders. Uh, okay, I think you may have misunderstood what I was saying. What, what, what I was talking about not germinating, these are not hybrids. These are parental- No, it's uh, the hybrid parents. These are parental Produce lines that the are used to generate seed. the hybrids, yes. From what I've been told that they, they don't, they're not going to work as well as the actual hybrids themselves. They're very wimpy, at least that's what they told me. But yes, I, I, with the breeders, yes. uh, hopefully they're working to actually make them work better, make, uh, uh, make them perform better. Yeah, I would really encourage you to, to have a look on, on this. Yes. And then one question is about the yield stability of those HD hybrids. Mm -hmm. From the table you showed, some of the hybrids seem to be very inconsistent across the two locations, like yielding. Yeah, I have the table here, yes. Yes. For example, the, at the bottom one hybrid, 5,000 something in one location, but only 2,000 in the other location. Uh, is, I find that there is quite some genotype by environment interaction, like the best hybrid in one location is it's not necessarily among the best in the other location. Mm -hmm. 
so I wonder about the, the heritability of those data or repeatability at the individual locations and then whether you are going to analyze also a little bit the yield stability of those uh, hybrids. Uh, so from what I've been told is that the, uh, the breeders and the agronomists, that is one of the criteria they use to select uh, the lines that they're going to move forward, uh, stability across environments. That's one of the criteria that they use, yes. So you are mm -hmm. right that some of them were consistent, but some were very, yeah, had very, very different numbers across environments. But uh, they said that that is one of the criteria they use, yeah. And if those yields are the yield and kg per hectare, why then is the bike grain production such a constraint? I mean, those yields are really good, so it shouldn't be so difficult to, to produce a ton in Ethiopia. I know, I know. It's, it, they look very <laughs> impressive to me, too. <laughs> Maybe they are overestimated? Or <laughs> I mean, if these are the actual yields, it should be easy to produce a ton mm -hmm. of the best ones. I do agree, yes. <laughs> well, these are, are all the comments. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Bettina. I think on one hand, after seven years that we've been circulating around the issue of getting grain, getting hybrid parents in, I'd really like to see some progress this year on developing a, on, on a clear strategy on whether or not these materials are, are going to go anywhere um, because we seem to be touching on this topic and not gaining a lot of traction. And as Bettina mentions, it's, it's, it's going to turn into a very interesting research project with very little application if we can't uh, solve this, uh, this question. So I'd really like to advocate and have you communicate to your team that progress on this question is really important this year as much as mm -hmm. possible. Other yes. questions from the audience? I don't see any hands up. Any Anything coming in by the chat box? Anybody typing? I don't see anything. Well, Joseph, I guess um, that's it then. Thank you very much for your presentation. And um, again, please uh, take the time to interact with your team members and, and convey questions to them. And, um, we can talk uh, at a uh, later date as you've had a chance to, to discuss these issues with them. And uh, we look forward to seeing your um, activities for this year as you develop them. And, you know, again, some formal contingency planning as well would be quite instrumental. So okay. with that, I want to thank everybody for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we'll reconvene tomorrow morning. Uh, Christine, would you, do you have anything to mention about that? Okay, uh, Christine, um, if you're talking, you're on mute. If not, I'll just go ahead. Oh, there you go. I oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so tomorrow we have uh, Dr. Kane's presentation at 9 and Dr. Ijeta at 11 and then in the afternoon the presentation will be at 3 3 p.m. all those times at uh, our central times and that will be Dr. Mangiste tomorrow afternoon um, so yeah that, that's it on my end and I think we're gonna stay uh, we're gonna stay on with the uh, advisory board right so thank you very much everyone for participating we'll ask the external advisory board to, to stay on and We'll wrap up. So we look forward to everyone participating tomorrow as much as possible and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Great presentation.